Okay, all right, there we go. So, this, folks, is the world's best solar panel. Human engineers cannot reproduce this. As much as we want to think we can, we can never do this as well as nature can do it. That's right. So, we cannot do this as well as it was created. This is a fabulous solar panel. This is a fabulous solar panel. This is a fabulous solar panel. This one's the best one right in this area because it's flat and big. And it, it also can shade more stuff. <laughs> yeah. So here's the deal. With monocultures, if you go out in a monoculture field any time of day, pretty much any time of the year, you're going to see a lot of sunlight hitting the ground. Okay? A lot of wasted sunlight. So I want two things in my diversity. I want story diversity. So I want low growing, intermediate growing, and high growing plants. Do we have that right here? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay? So we've got all of that here. Second, I want to see as much variety of leaf architecture, leaf shape, as I can possibly see. Do we have that here? Yes. yes. So how much photosynthetic leakage are we going to have here? Minimal, right? We never capture 100%, but we have minimal. But if we were back over there, how much photosynthetic leakage did we have? 72%. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to add in the point three two. But, I, but I, I, I don't go. You were rounding off. You were yeah, I go for accuracy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, so it's very important to have the stories in the multiplicity of leaf architecture. That is going. If we talk about sequestering carbon, all of the other things that you hear everybody talking about ad nauseum today. It's not monoculture corn and cotton and wheat and soybean fields that are going to do that. They are not going to do that. It is all, and it's not conventionally grazed pastures of low diversity that are going to do that. It is only through regeneratively grazed situations that we're creating that and we're optimizing the capture of carbon and so forth. So, what would we anticipate here relative to our shovel test? Okay. There are several. This is gravelly here. Where do we get out of the gravel, Mike? Right here. Okay. I got a sweat while we're going. So leaf area index is the leaf area index is the ratio of square feet of leaves over square foot of soil, or you can think acres of leaves over an acre of soil. We have this uh, grass and there's clover here. We have this patch, um, and it's going to have a certain LAI leaf area index. We have this big old tree over there. What, 50, 60 feet tall, lots of leaves and that. Where do we have the higher leaf area index? The tree over there or this patch of grass right here? Patch of grass. That's a trick question. It's, it, it is the forest over there. But it is surprisingly small difference between a healthy grassland that's four or five foot tall compared to a forest that's 60 foot tall. Um, and one way you can tell that is measuring the photon interception at ground level here. Um, it's every bit as dark under this patch of grass as it is if we're under the trees in there. I count leaves all the time. How many layers of leaves there that the sunlight's going through? And it's common to be in good management with seven leaves. You can get to 11, maybe a few more, but that's about the limit. Then you're out of sunlight and there's nothing else growing. But I like to hit that 
I like to go through, if I drop a pin down through the pasture, I want it to hit about seven or more leaves before I turn in the cattle. When I come out, I like to hit at least four probably. The way that I test for the, the leaf is I'll take like a stick or I carry a grazing stick, even a step in fence post, stick it down to the surface of the soil, then count the amount of leaves it touches the stick post, whatever you're using. Put it in this way, like that, and then stand over top and look at it. Yeah. That's measuring a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so uh, what do you see here? Hold hold that up and oh yeah, that that side. So tell tell us what you see, guys. Okay, big color difference, right? Actual soil. It looks like actual soil, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's darker colored, right? In terms of, so it's got more carbon, do what? Okay, you got a whole lot more roots in here, right? Okay, do we see, whoops, do we see some ev evidence of aggregation? Yes. Yes, there, there's some. However, there's still plated layers here, okay? From prior, you know, influences and all of that. So it still has the, the plated layers where you've got some bulk density there and all of that. So so that's still there and y'all can see a plate right here. You see how it's just completely intact and pretty dense? Okay, if you smell the aroma, the aroma is much better. You can smell the fungal component in here. It no longer has that metallic or acidic aroma to it. So it, so it is a very, very nice aroma here. Uh, and we can see that the plants and the microbe interface, this interaction between them is starting to, to work. It's starting to do its job. You know, again, if we, you know, we can, we can see some aggregates clinging to the roots and I can see a little bit of root coating. Okay. Some sheath coating with soil covering the roots. So we want to see that as well. There we go. That's a really good one. Thank you. That's what we're wanting to find. You should not see bare exposed white roots in really good biologically active soil. You should not see white bare roots. So that's your fungal indicator. That, that's right, that's a strong fungal indicator. So both the dingleberries, okay, <laughs> and the, 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 the rhizosheath coating, both are very, very strong indicators. So we call it the dingleberries and the dreadlocks of the soil, okay? So we want to see dingleberries and dreadlocks in our soil. That That's, now also, look at how easily, even though we've got some plated layers, it's breaking those up with all the root system. And you see all these fine fibrous roots here? They're, they're the ones that do the job, breaking these plated layers up. But you see how easily this soil you know, it just sort of crumbles, you know. And again, a nice aroma. Let's take one more, like right well, out in here I, somewhere. I, I need to play some devil's advocate. Greg Rand. Uh-oh. In 1858, what did this landscape look like? Some trees. In 1858? Really? Uh, so. You think so? When, maybe not. When, maybe, when, maybe, it, when, maybe it all been plowed with mules at that point. You betcha. Yeah. If you look at pictures from the landscape, from the, like the Battle of Franklin, the Battle of uh, 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 Stones River or Murfreesboro, you see a much more open landscape and it's being farmed. All right. So I think 150 years ago, up to, you know, I don't know, 1920, 1950, whenever, a whole lot of this land was, there was corn grown on this, there was tobacco grown on this, and over there we had clay. In 1750, that clay probably had a good loam or silt loam cover on it that, um, um, supported good grass on there and then it was farmed and washed away i just checked this soil here and 
that is much closer to a silt loam, possibly a silty clay loam, because there has been less erosion here because we're a little less steep slope than there. And so we did not recreate this soil in the seven years time or whatever Mike has owned this. Um, this was in a better condition before than what that on that slope is. Can we restore this on that slope there? Yes. It's a lifetime work though. Oh yeah. It's, it's a lifetime's good. work, but we can fix that kind of damage. Uh, I just don't want any of you who are new to farming to think that in seven years time, you can turn red dirt into gray or black dirt. Right. This is three years, by the way. Three years? Three, three okay. Years. Yeah, but this up here, where we have so much better cover, it was better site to begin with than that side slope. Yeah. And I got the microphone all dirty for everyone now. We have collected a few more plants here. Here's This one's real interesting. This is a curly dock. Look at the root on it. We talk a lot about radish. This one's just native, and it's got a root as long as my arm, and it'll get about as big around as my arm if you let it grow. It's a sign of low oxygen, but it's fixing the soil. It is, it's, I'm convinced that it's, convinced, it's uh, improving the soil. It'll grow in those compacted areas and low wet areas. Cattle love it. Cattle yep. love it, especially in the and spring. Sheep. In about March, they'll just take it, they'll grub it out. Grab, sheep yep. love it too. Goldenrod, in general, I think long recovery when I see goldenrod. Now, I'm talking about a full field of goldenrod. But this one, uh, you know, a splattering of it, it's still here, but not so much. It's a great pollinator. It's not like ragweed as far as being an allergen, uh, even though it's got the, the name of that. So, another one here, yeah. In my area, a lot of people call this one cow itch vine. <laughs> I don't know why they got, ever got that name. Trumpet creeper, great for hummingbirds. Usually you see it only be a problem in hay fields uh, because it, they graze it out here. You see good grazing on it, don't you, Mike? Yeah, that's the same one, trumpet creeper. And uh, here's the plantain. You know, this was an upright one. Uh, you, you, we were, where we were standing a minute ago had a bunch of it. When it goes upright, it's just a forage. I, I wouldn't worry about it at all. And then we got two more here. We've got a turnip. This one's the turnip, and you, then you see the radish, and and it has a more variegated, not variegated, uh, inset on the leaf there. You can see the root had a little issue. Then don't think you've got compaction just because these start coming out of the ground. They all come out of the ground at the top. Uh, that's not, they're not pushing up that way. That's just the way they grow. But this is the, it did have an issue. Hit something there. Oh, he may have stumped me on this one. Anybody know this one? I don't, it's not not weed. Uh, I, I don't know this one. It's an interesting plant and it's not, not going to cause any issues. I would just look at it as adding to the, the diversity here. This is brown-eyed Susan and it's actually better adapted uh, in the area than black-eyed Susan, more native. If you order seed from Roundstone or something and you're doing a native planting, a lot of time they'll put this in there and it'll last for about a couple of years. Animals typically don't graze it a lot. Mike, you seen any grazing on this one? Not on no, that, no, no, but but I don't see it be an issue either. So uh, you know, you could put a small amount in your seed mix if you were to do something, uh, but I wouldn't go overboard. Is that good for Coreopsis? Is another one. I wouldn't plant Coreopsis because they usually don't grow graze it. So be cautious with some of the pollinators. Is that one good for pollinators? It is. The brown out. Uh, I think he said it was good for bumblebee, the blue. Okay. Yeah, and he also, yeah. Annual, right? What's that? Coreopsis is an annual. Which I believe it is. Which Coreopsis? Yeah, yeah it was, there's it several, there's a yes. lot of Coreopsis. I find the okay. Plains Coreopsis to be really palatable. Okay. Yeah. okay. And then Cockerbur, our old friend. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this one will move around on the animal's tail and, and all, and it's got a big broad leaf, a lot of light interception. Uh, I pull this one up and put it in the back of the truck and seed the whole farm if I don't get it out of the back of the truck. But, uh, but yeah. Can't lead it. Really? 
Yeah. They'll eat it. They will. Yeah, they'll yeah. eat it. That's not a problem, but it's still bad. It's and, and sheep will really eat it. Yeah. 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 Sheep like it quite a bit. And it, but it contaminates wool and it could get on the sheath of the animal and they can't breed. Uh, so, yeah. And then crabgrass, yeah. This is second, this is my second favorite weed or plant. It's crabgrass. And it's the one that, that I seed uh, if I'm overseeding a pig area or something and can't do anything else, then I just throw out some crabgrass along with other stuff. But uh, it's it's a great seeder and reseeder. So it's a great component. A lot of times if I'm seeding annuals, I'll seed crabgrass the year before I do perennials, and then this will continue to fill in voids in the future. Got a question? Listen, on the crabgrass, is there any protein value in that? Animal? Oh, yeah, it's real good protein. Like, is there a lot of sugar in it? There would be just when it's when it's vegetated. All of them lose sugars when they get more mature. But yeah, yeah, it's good. 